Hello, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're here today with Ingrid Schaffner. Ingrid is the senior curator at Philadelphia's Institute of Contemporary Art. Her upcoming show this fall will be Bill Walton's studio. Bill Walton died in 2010. He was a a Philadelphia artist, and they are going to bring his studio, as he left it, into the project space at ICA. Very exciting. Ingrid's a popular speaker on contemporary art and topics like collage and surrealism. She's written several books and essays on artists as diverse as Bruce Nauman, Salvador Dali, and Karen Kalimnik. So Ingrid, tell us about your wide-ranging interest in art. Uh, For example, in 2010, you curated Queer Voice, which was performance and video, some of it kind of raunchy and spicy. And in the same year, you organized the Myra Coleman Show, which had some of the sweetest work seen this side of wherever. (laughs) Is there anything you don't like? Queer Voice happened uh, because the first time I experienced Ryan Trey Carton's work, performance-based, video, art, what uh, struck me was the quality of voice. And the voice was like an image. It was as present as a sculptural material in the room and um, brought forward the voices of Jack Smith, the voice of Warhol, the voice of... uh, Lori Anderson, an artist who, you know, we think of her in terms of her manipulations of voice and a queering of voice. So it came from the art, led me back to the past, and um, I hope like puts a viewer in the present of the presence of the work itself. And maybe that's like the triangle that I'm always groping my way towards. So you've been at the ICA since uh, 2001, and it's 10 years now. It's yes, your 10th it anniversary. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Uh, you're a transplanted New Yorker. Um, do you have any role, a thought on the roles that cities play in incubating talent or killing talent? Um, cities play a huge role in uh, supporting and creating different art communities. In fact, one of the first essays I wrote when I first came to Philadelphia was commissioned by the Pew, and it was to write about the, what I, I wanted to write about the ecology of Philadelphia. Every city has a sort of its basses, its minnows, its, I don't know, rotifers and algae uh, (laughs) and turtles and uh, maybe, um, you know, more or less of these things, but something that, um, you know, what makes your um, ecology unique. And one thing that makes Philadelphia unique is artists staying here and this community that, um, I'm going to sound like a plug for the Pew, that that Pew (laughs) and the Philadelphia Exhibition Initiative has cultivated here, a real conversation about the curatorial and curatorial practice, and um, I've been really lucky to be part of that conversation. Can you give an example of something that you did here that um, that was specifically influenced by the local culture? Um, Virgil Marty um, exhibition that um, Claudia and I invited Virgil last year to be a guest curator to um, raid the icebox of the Philadelphia Museum of Arts collection. So. Um, that's certainly something that comes from Philadelphia's particular ground. And Warhol, um, Warhol was um, really one of the first artists to do one of these raid, what was called Raid the Icebox, where an artist was invited to go into a museum's collection and make an exhibition. So the first was Warhol going to the Rhode Island School of Design's museum. And Warhol would just like point to a painting rack and the curators are madly trying to figure out, well, which painting are you pointing at, Mr. Warhol? And he's, that one. And what he, what he wanted was the whole rack. So they just like, they moved the whole rack into the galleries. And then he's in the decorative arts collection. And he, you know, um, points to some chairs. Those, you know, like all these racks of chairs end up upstairs. And shoes, whole cupboards full of shoes. Oh, and there's a great moment in this uh, where uh, uh, he's pointing at the shoe cupboard and the decorative arts curator is like, but Mr. Warhol, there's repetition. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, So uh, I didn't have an immediate hand in the locally localized gravity exhibition that Janelle Porter, along with Elise Gonzalez and Naomi Beckwith, uh, organized here a couple of years ago. 
but it came from Claudia Gold, our director, and I wanting to see something that responded to this great artist-initiated collaborative energy in Philadelphia, like, you know, Space 1026. And that exhibition has had a lot of impact in our field. It's constantly referred, referenced and referred to and copied as other institutions do similar projects. One of the things that's on my mind is that at the time of that show, there were a lot of people in the community who were really angry about it. And, oh, and they uh -huh. said, my God, this mm -hmm. is just people playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and somehow over time, I've heard less of that. And, you know, it sort of has taken some kind of hold. But in the course of doing shows, you mm -hmm. must see reviews that where people complain bitterly about things because that's the nature of, of how things are. What do you do with that? Okay, worse is if you hear nothing. <laughs> it's actually, um, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting when people get riled. Um, we, we don't, we're not here to be provocateurs, but yes, if you strike a chord, you're going to hear praise, hopefully, but maybe you're also going to hear um, uh, chappiness as well. Maybe you only hear chappiness, but that means that you've touched on something, and you don't want to go into it just looking for praise. But don't and you? what's wrong with play? I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Uh -huh. And what's wrong with provoking? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, isn't that actually what the function is, to provoke with some of the programming here? Yeah, to raise questions and um, get people thinking and looking and talking. Absolutely. Ingrid, let's um, ask you about some of your background. You okay. seem to know... Background check. Yes, background check. You know an awful lot of our history, so, and you went to Mount Holyoke mm -hmm. undergrad and NYU's Institute of Fine Arts for Graduate School. So were you an art history major, and is that where you came up with all this art history knowledge? Um, I was a drawer when I went to Mount Holyoke College, which is a liberal arts school, and you're encouraged to try many things. I was taking studio classes, and. I took an art history class, and it opened my eyes to art history, which I did not know existed, that you could sit in a dark room while an erudite person told you about the wonders and treasures of the world. It was like a perfect marriage of all the things that I like to do, and writing, looking, going to museums, processing information, history. So. When I was graduating, I didn't know what I was doing, and there on the bulletin board in the art history library was an uh, um, advertisement for the Whitney Independent Study Program. And so I applied to that, not really knowing what it was. And um, it was, there were, we were 12 curators and then 12 artists, all in the same loft building in Lower Manhattan. And our charge as young curators to be was to organized exhibitions for the satellite spaces that the Whitney used to have in the city. Um, so we had an exhibition that was, you know, going to open in three months. And so I see that now as like the kernel for the work that I have continued to do. I'm out in the field. I'm looking at stuff. I have my subjectivities, I guess, that sort of everyone does kind of um, guides where you are inclined to look. Out of the Whitney, I um, began to do independent curatorial projects, always doing other things to support my curatorial habit slash work. And that didn't pay the, the bills? Body of work. Heck no. No, no. Uh, one thing I did a lot of was um, worked for artists in their studios working on artist archives. So I worked with um, Richard Archwager most significantly for a number of years. Uh, when you are uh, curating, you work with people often who are alive. And I'm wondering about that process and how you interact with them. And um, have you ever had to deal with somebody who is extremely difficult? And how do you, how does this work? Difficult, I've come to learn, is maybe code word for uh, artists have very precise visions of what their work is. A lot of the work of the work is getting that vision out there and to, and to guard it and to ensure it and to um, make sure that others respect and understand it. That's um, actually, I won't say it's always the pleasure, often it's the challenge, but it's certainly what makes working with contemporary living artists very exciting and 
enriching. I, I feel like I gain a deeper understanding of what the what the work is and what's at stake for an artist in their work by going through those processes and those conversations. Tell us about the show that you curated as an independent curator, Gloria. Gloria. Wanting to look at feminism because there was so much work in the sort of later 90s that was referencing really first generation feminist art, whether knowingly or unknowingly, didn't matter, need to bring that material forward. It was a small show of um, iconic works by Valley Export, Hannah Wilkie, Laurie Anderson, Martha Rosler. These are like the textbook uh, works that you know and you study and yet by and large they belonged to the artists themselves because museums had not collected them. It, it, that show was like a powder keg. It was, it was not a big exhibition but everything was so supercharged. So this exhibition like, like it took on a life of its own. It traveled uh, extensively. Came to Philadelphia. Came to Philadelphia, came to Moore, it went to um, Judith Tannenbaum, brought it to RISD and um, the show was in Texas, and a student came up to me afterwards and said, Mrs. Schaffner, I didn't, I grew up in the suburbs, I didn't know there was such a thing as feminist art. And I'm quoting, I'm not making that up, somebody actually said that to me. And you work in an institution that's where the women are, the powerhouses. I work in a field where the women are the powerhouses. <laughs> is that really true? That's the curatorial field is uh, uh, a good field for women. It's a, it's a field full of women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering what that means when you hesitated there and said it's full of women. There are a lot of women directors. Our director, Claudia Gould, um, great, powerful women directors. But there is a statistic about there's a kind of glass ceiling for institutions, and Deharna Court was certainly an exception to that role. So the big museums um, do not have women as directors by and large. Is that an ambition of yours? No, to be a director, no. It's not, yeah. What is your I, ambition? I'm curious. It's not where the play I, 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 is, is. No, it? no, no, no. There's absolute play as a director. I mean, you're playing with a program and you're building an institution. I mean, these are very creative jobs. But um, for me, it would take me away from writing is a very important part of my work, making exhibitions, the crafting of exhibitions, being in artist studios. That's sort of my, that's my primary interest. Do you still draw? Poorly, yes. Yeah. And do you use that in your curating? No, it's not drawing so much. I have, to, I have to say, it's more cartooning and writing and uh, it's never drawing, drawing, drawing. <laughs> you used to make a zine yeah, called Pink. Pink. Yeah. <laughs> oh, tell us about that. Everyone has a zine in their past. Mine was Pink. <laughs> <laughs> So I was the co-editrix of Pink with um, Donna Gellerter, who's a textile historian and independent scholar. We, we called it an occasional, because it would appear occasionally, Pink, um, that was devoted to life's distractions, life's pleasures. So it was, of course, art and architecture and cooking and you know, the things that keep you curious. And each one had a theme, and each one had a an artist did a cover, did the cover, Karen Klimek did a, a cover for Pink, uh, Joan Nelson did a cover, Mary Heilman. They were very handmade. Uh, Donna and I would laboriously sew the uh, issues of Pink together on an industrial sewing machine and then pink the edges, so it's pinking shears, because pink is a color and it's also, yes, there's pinking shears. We also learned that pink I guess a Britishism is to mildly insult someone is to pink them. It's <laughs> riding pinks and I mean, many pinks. So maybe one of the reasons that we stopped doing pink is the first issue was six pages and by the last issue it was 20 some pages. <laughs> and you just could like, you could not get the pinking shears through the paper or our bloodied little hands. And it was supported by its subscribers and their interests. That was the other idea of pink. Uh, so you had subscribers? Like we did. You made we did, Roberta. We actually had subscribers. Cool. <laughs> here, I have an issue of pink here. Oh, this is mine. I drew. I drew that. Wow, these yes. are beautiful. Yeah, they're, they are. There's the Mary Hyman. You Hylmans. could cut yourself on that pink dash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we ended up doing t like t maybe ten issues, twelve issues. 
And um, Donna and I like to think that um, pink may rise again. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Could it rise as fuchsia, or is it going to remain? No, pink? no, it remain. It will remain. It will remain pink. Well, Ingrid, thank you so much. We've been talking with Ingrid Schaffner, thank Schaffner you, thank senior you, curator at ICA. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.